Okay, this is our lecture on muscle tissue, and hopefully you have your notes. So let's look over, get your notes. That should say muscle tissue on there. This is kind of like a little um, uh, tour through muscle and some parts about muscle. So muscle tissue comprises about 40 to 50% of the body by weight. Now we have characteristics here. Number one is excitability. The ability to conduct and respond to a stimulus. There are only two tissues that can do that. One of them is nervous tissue, and the one we're studying now is muscle tissue. Number two, contractility. The ability to shorten in length. Other tissues can't shorten. They can recoil, like elastic fibers can recoil, but um, muscle can not only recoil, but it can be stretched back to normal. So number three is extensibility, the ability of the tissue to stretch. So like when you're doing warm-up exercises and you're stretching, you're getting ready to use your muscles. And number four is elasticity, the ability of the tissue to contract and relax. So this tissue can change its shape in response to a stimulus and the removal of a stimulus. So it can alter its shape, and it's the only one that can do that. Muscle is the only tissue that can do that. Now, functions. Number one, produce skeletal movement, uh, such as walking, talking, and lifting. So muscles are involved in doing that, maintaining uh, you know, movement. Number two, maintain body posture and position, such as standing and sitting. And so you know that as long as you're conscious, you can sit up and watch TV and walk. But uh, when your muscles are relaxed, you're slumped over, like when you're sleeping. Number three, support soft tissues. Form walls for the abdominal and pelvic support. So the muscles in your belly are actually forming walls to protect and hold in place your abdominal organs. Number four, guards entrances and exits. Circular muscles are called sphincters, and you have sphincters uh, all throughout your body that control the movement of substances, like uh, your eyes for blinking. Those are the orbicularis oculi. Your mouth, you can change the uh, shape of your mouth from opening wide to bite a Subway sandwich or to constrict to suck on a straw. Then you have other sphincters that uh, control things, in your digestive tract. There's one that uh, is at the base of your stomach called the pyloric sphincter, and it opens uh, periodically to allow some of the contents of your stomach to leave and go into your small intestine. You have sphincters in your urinary tract uh, for uh, controlling those for urination. And there are even some that are in your uh, cardiovascular system that control blood flow to your extremities. You know, sometimes you have cold hands, there's less blood flowing to your hands and your feet. Other times, uh, your hands and feet are pretty warm. So there's something that controls the blood flow to your extremities, and those are a type of a sphincter um, that you have, and we'll talk about that in the cardiovascular system. Number four, guards, entrances, and exits. Well, that gets along to uh, what I was just talking about, so I think I'm repeating that one. Uh, number five, maintains body temperature. Muscle movement breaks down ATP, which releases energy, uh, most of which is in the form of heat. Now, ATP is the energy molecule of, your, of the cell, and you use it constantly, and your body's constantly building ATP back up, and it's constantly using it when it needs to. Now, when ATP is broken down, it releases the, when the phosphate is taken off of the end of ATP to make it a DP, diphosphate, Energy is released, and part of that energy is actually dues, uh, used to perform a task, a muscle contraction, or some chemical event in your body. The rest is given off in the form of heat. And you know that if you do an exercise, if you're exercising, you do things over and over and over, you get kind of hot. And that's because you're breaking down a lot of ATP, and the energy that's supposed to be uh, used, called the free energy, is allowing the events to occur for your muscle contractions. Rest is given off in the form of heat. That's why you get so hot. <clears throat> your body's trying to give off a lot of heat. Now, 
Now, types of muscle tissue. We've uh, looked at these when we were in um, the tissue phase of this course, and you can see that there's skeletal or striated muscle. Uh, voluntary muscle connects bone to bone, so skeletal muscle is voluntary. Smooth muscle is also called visceral muscle. Visceral means organ, so it's involuntary muscle around organs, like your digestive tract and your blood vessels, are surrounded by smooth muscle. And cardiac muscle, or myocardium. Myo means muscle, cardium is heart. So it's an involuntary muscle. You don't control your heart. Uh, that's car myocardium, cardiac muscle. Those are heart muscle. Uh, we're going to be talking about some fascia. <clears throat> and we can look on the next slide, and I'll talk about it. The first, uh, fascia is a fibrous connective tissue sheet. Now your first blank is called superficial fascia. Superficial fascia also called the subcutaneous layer, covers the entire body. The outer layer is adipose, and the inner layer is loose connective tissue. Remember, loose connective tissue has a lot of elastic and collagen fibers, and some cells are in there. Holds the skin to the underlying muscle, offers support to blood vessels and nerves. That's what holds your skin to your muscle, so they don't really slide if you move your skin I twist it across the surface of your arm, it, it spins back like it was, and so is the muscle. So it holds those together, as well as holds your blood vessels in place between your skin muscle. And people that have veins that roll, their superficial fascia is not very good around their blood vessels, and they tend to slide. And the person that's taking blood or trying to inject you has to kind of trap your vein so they can stick the needle in it. Other people, have good superficial fascia and their vessels stay put. Deep fascia, deep fascia, connects uh, dense connective tissue, holds muscles together. And we're gonna, so what we're gonna look at on this slide here, we're gonna look at the deep, but let me uh, finish the different types of fascia first. Then you have subserous fascia. This is the fibrous layer of a serous membrane. That's basically what it is. Remember, serous membranes have a fibrous backing and the, and the secretory portion of a serous membrane is simple squamous epithelium that sits on top of that. <clears throat> now your deep fascia and components. On this slide here, let me get my little handout. <clears throat> the first blank there is called the epimesium. Now epi means upon, and the mesium, it has to do with muscle. Epimesium, the dense fibrous connective tissue covering the entire muscle. So you can see where I'm pointing to here. This covers the entire muscle. Epimesium. It's called deep connective tissue, deep fascia. Now that covers the whole muscle. And so let's look on this picture on the lower left, and you'll see that the, uh, they don't have it pointed out, but the epimesium is on the outside. It will go in and it will cover bundles of muscle fibers here, and the bundles are called fascicles. So you see muscle fascicle. Here's one up here, muscle fascicle. A bundle of muscle fibers. A bundle of sticks is a fascicle. A bundle of pencils is a fascicle. And a bundle of muscle fibers is a fascicle. If you look up here in the upper right of your picture, you have three, six, seven, eight fascicles here. Eight fascicles. So when the epimesium goes in and covers fascicles, okay, that's called the perimesium. So perimesium is covering eight muscle fibers here. A bundle of muscle fibers is called the perimesium. The perimesium then goes in and covers each individual muscle fiber as the endomesium. So here's the muscle fiber here. Here's the fascicle in here. That the paramecium is covering the fascicles, the, you know, the fascicles, and then it goes in and covers each of the cells inside. That's called the endomecium. Invaginations of the paramecium, which cover the individual cells. So epimecium covers the entire muscle. It goes in and covers bundles of muscle cells. The bundles are called fascicles, and the deep connective tissue that covers the fascicles is called paramecium. 
and the, the paramecium goes in and covers each each uh, each uh, muscle fiber, and it's called the endomecium. So it depends depends on where it is. You see up here against the person. Here we have a tendon. Tendon, deep fascia, connective tissue sheet, which attaches a muscle to a bone. Remember, the muscles are going to have an origin and insertion. Both of those are tendons. The uh, the deep connective tissue that attaches the muscle to a bone. An aponeurosis we don't see on here, but it's a a p o n e u r o s i s. <clears throat> Broad sheet of deep fascia. Okay, well, this is going to bridge from one muscle to another. So one that I put here is the galea aponeurotica. It goes across the top of your head. And you know you have muscles uh, on the side of your head above your ear, temporalis muscles. And in the back, you have a whole bunch back here. One of them is the occipitalis. And there is connective tissue that joins the two sides. It goes across the top of your head. And that connective tissue is called an aponeurosis. So it, it attaches muscle to muscle. So uh, it's, it's not muscle to bone, it's muscle to muscle. Now you have tendon sheaths in your notes here. It's already filled in. Fibrous connective tissue tubes, which are lined with synovial membrane. These sheaths hold tendons in place and allow them to slide easily. <clears throat> well, one easy place to, to notice that is your wrist. Your wrist has a tendon sheath around it, like a, a sweat band for playing tennis. And it holds those tendons down. When you um, look at the top of your hand and stretch your fingers out well wide open, and you see those things coming away from your fingers, those are tendons. And they're going to the muscles on the upper part of your arm. Now look at your palm and flex your, flex your fingers in, but you don't see them. Nothing, nothing raises up. So you have a little tendon sheath around your wrist that holds those tendons down so they don't, you know, uh, uh, project up. You have little webs there. But you can see them moving. If you look at your hand, look at your palm, and then look at your wrist, and then move your fingers up and down. You look in your palm. I mean, look, look at your wrist. I mean, you can see the, uh, the tendons moving, but they're not popping up. They're not popping up because the tendon sheath allows them to slide, and it holds them down. So you get a more efficient movement out of that muscle. Now a ganglion is your tendon sheath. And a ganglion is going to show up like a little marble under your skin. And you can have those popped by the doctor, or they can stick a needle in there and aspirate them. You know, whatever they need to do, they can remove the fluid. But it's a ruptured tendon sheath. Satellite cells. Mm -hmm. Dormant cell. Uh, st dormant stem cell. You know what stem cells are, right? Found in association with skeletal muscles. They can fuse with each other to form new muscle cells because stem cells can become any cell, right? Now, these that are going to be forming uh, muscle, they just call them satellite cells. When you were forming, the next blank, myoblast, M-Y-O-B-L-A-S-T, you know, blast means builder, and myo means muscle, muscle builders. So look at the definition. During embryological development, these cells fuse together to form muscle cells. This is the reason skeletal muscles are multinucleate, because when these myoblasts join together, each one of them brings a nucleus with it. And when you put one and one together, now you have two nuclei there. Well, you have many that join together for your skeletal muscle. And you'll notice if you have in the tissues that the uh, skeletal muscles are multinucleate. And they have some strong variations that we will look at a little bit later. Now, so fibers, you see the muscle cell here in the middle of your picture. Um, myofibers, long, cylindrical, multinucleated striatus cells, which lay parallel to, to one another. And you can see on that picture, in fact, let me, uh, let's go to the next picture. Here we go. Here's a muscle cell here. You know, remember from tissues, they're long, cylindrically shaped cells. They're multinucleate. You can see all the nuclei there. They push peripherally, and they have striations or bands. So you can see that they're long, cylindrical, multinucleate, striated cells, and they lay parallel to each other. Um, we have we have seen that 
uh, on slides. And you have to look at another slide to see that. Now, muscle cells have some special naming of some of the features uh, in them. And one is your first word there, where it says flesh sheath. Now look at the picture here, I'm pointing to it. The sarcolemma. Sarco means flesh and lemma means sheath. It's the, the uh, cell membrane of a muscle cell, but it's called the sarcolemma, the plasma membrane of a muscle cell, sarcolemma. And so when you're talking about muscles, you're gonna, you're gonna use that term. Now the fluid inside of a muscle cell, well, it's also been given a special name called the sarcoplasm. So we have sarcolemma, sarcoplasm. Let me underline those for you. Put it in red. Here's sarcolemma, and there's sarcoplasm. Now, a third thing about muscles is they do have endoplasmic reticula. And you can see them as blue structures on this uh, picture here, but they have a different function. So they're called the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Let me get my pointer right again. Here it is down here, sarcoplasmic reticulum. And it means, you know, uh, it, it, it's the endoplasmic reticulum of the muscle cells. Smooth ER of a muscle cell, but look at their function. Calcium is stored in the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Okay, so their endoplasmic reticulum is called the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Sarcoplasmic reticulum. Now there are some other structures, I'll change my color to blue, uh, called T-tubules. Now here at the bottom is where I'm going to circle this one. But you can see uh, some yellow lines, or little, little tubes paralleling the sarcoplasmic reticulum there. And those are also T-tubules, going from one side to the other. T-tubules means transverse tubule. They go from one side to the other, one side to the other. And it is sarcolemma that runs through. So the T-tubules are made of sarcolemma, but they go across the cell, and they're called T-tubules or transverse tubules. Now, you see that on either side of that T-tubule, there's sarcoplasmic reticulum. So your next little word there is called a triad. And at the bottom here, I'll use, um, oh, maybe I'll use, I'll use black. And at the bottom, you have the triad. Now the triad is a T-tubule and it's two associated sarcoplasmic reticula. Okay, it's surrounded. So a sarcoplasmic reticulum, T-tubule, sarcoplasmic reticulum. That's called a triad. It's called a triad. Now, the myofibril, myofibril, M-Y-O-F-I-B-R-I-L. I'm looking for a color here. I'll circle this at the top. Here's myofibril right there. A cylindrical mass of two kinds of myofilaments. And here it is over here also on the, on the left, myofibril. There it is. Two types of myofilaments. Uh, One is called actin, and actin are going to be the thin myofilaments. And the other ones are called myosin. So it's actin and myosin. That's what I have here. Actin, thin myofilaments, myosin, thick. It's easy to determine which one's thin and which one's thick. Actin and thin sound alike, so myosin is the thick one. <clears throat> now, um, these are called sarcomeres. Sarco means flesh, and mirror means unit or part. These are flesh units, and they extend from one Z line to another. Now, the Z lines are right here. So let me draw uh, an arrow. There is one Z line, and here's the other, and it's, this one's labeled. So from Z line to Z line, that's one sarcomere, and they have it bracketed at the bottom here, sarcomere. Flesh part, a contractile unit extending from one Z line to another. 
Now in your notes, I have uh, some sarcomeres there. You have a blank there, and it's anisotropic band. They call it an A band. So the top one here is the A band. There it is, anisotropic. That's your dark band. Extends the entire length of the mouse and myofilament. There's an overlap of thick and thin myofilaments here. And we're going to look at those in just a minute. But you can see that, oh, it doesn't point it out, but yeah, it does. Here's the thick filaments, the, the, the uh, purple ones. Those are myosin. And the thin ones, the actin, are the little red ones. Well, you see that this is a zone here. It's called the A-band. It's where the actin and myosin overlap each other. You can see the actin and myosin are overlapping. And it makes it more dense in that, in that area. And so that's going to be the dark line of a striation. Whereas over here, the I band, that's your next one, isotropic band or the light band, just consists of actin, the red, the red filaments. And it's less dense and so it's light. So you can see a little bit of uh, the a, a band over here. Then you go I band. So it goes dark, light, dark, light, dark, light. And that's the striations in a muscle has to do with the overlapping and the non-overlapping of the myofilaments, actin and myosin. Now here is a slide here showing a progression to the sarcomere. Your, your skeletal muscle, your muscle, they're going to pick out a, a, a fibril here, a fascicle here. Well, get your muscle fiber here, I mean, there's your nucleus. But here's your myofibril, so they're going to show you next. And there's your triad, sarcoplasmic reticulum, T-tubule, sarcoplasmic reticulum. Here's a Z-line here. Here's a Z-line over here. That's one sarcomere. And now they're showing you what that looks like in a drawing form from this Z-line. Let's see, right there. And this Z-line right there. You can see that where it overlaps in the middle, that's the dark band, and then it gets light on either side for your, for your striations, light, dark, light. So we're going to look at this uh, um, sarcomere in a little more detail and see how, how, it, uh, is, um, how it functions a little bit later. But this is showing you a sarcomere, and it's an overlap of actin and mouse and myofilaments. And let's, uh, let's see... On your notes, where are we? Actin is a double helix. So let's look at the next one. Next slide and see what actin and myosin actually look like. Here's actin up here, and it's a thin myofilament. You can see there. It's a double helix. If you had like a pearl necklace that was joined together and you twisted it, that's what it looks like. All these actin molecules, like a pearl necklace, and they're twisted. It's in a helix. Uh, having your notes, actin is a double-stranded helix of the actin protein molecules. Another protein, and you can write this in, tropomyosin, there it is, tropomyosin, lies in the groove of the actin double helix. It kind of follows it, kind of basically, follows the, uh, the twisting uh, motion. So let me get my colors out again. Here, here's your tropomyosin down here. There it is. A second protein, troponin, there it is, is uh, regularly spaced along the tropomyosin molecule. So you can see, you know, hand back out again, troponin, tropomyosin, troponin, tropomyosin, troponin. So it's, it's at regular intervals. The tropomyosin is the long strand of, of that protein, and then the troponin is spaced at regular intervals along that protein. Now down here, you have myosin. At the very bottom, here's a myosin molecule down here. And I'll circle that, there's myosin. And you see it looks like a little golf club with two heads here. There's two, actually two little globes here. They're called cross bridges. So they're, they're called heads or cross bridges, either one. But the myosin is thick because they're arranged in bubbles. So you see a whole bunch of myosins are held together and their heads are directed uh, out to the side of that bundle. 
They go all around. I will show you uh, something a little bit later. It's on the contraction uh, slide, I mean a set of notes, and we'll go over a little bit more of the detail of this. But myosins are joined together in bundles as they're thick, and so they're blue inside of here. There's your myosin. Your actins are double helix of actin with troponin and tropomyosin along the groove, and they're the red ones here. Goes all the way to the Z lines. Z lines are also made of actin. So we're going to look at the sliding filament theory, a shortening of the sarcomere. So this sarcomere for muscle, there are millions of these in your muscle cells, millions of them. And this is going to shorten from Z line to Z line is going to be pulled in toward the middle until these myosins butt up against the Z lines. So it will shorten. Z lines are drawn closer together. Actin and my myosin myofilaments slide past one another, and we're going to see how that works. It has to do with a little of this action on this head here, this myosin head down here. Um, let's look at, um, I'm not sure what the change yet. I guess I am. The neuromuscular junction. So the neuromuscular junction, that means the junction between the nerve and the muscle is how the two uh, communicate with each other. So your, your notes say a space bordered by an axon terminal. That's what this is right here. This synaptic knob or end bulb is a synaptic. It's also called an axon terminal on one side and the sarcolemma, that's the plasma membrane of the muscle cell on the other. There's space in between called the synaptic cleft. So let's, I'm getting a little bit ahead. So let's just look at some stuff. Uh, your the thin branches off the end of an axon. Here's an axon. Here, all these are dendrites, which are going to conduct an impulse toward the cell body. Remember, the cell body is the part of the cell that has the nucleus, and only one axon is going to leave. And there it is. I have it real small lettering there. Axon with an arrow. <clears throat> it's going to leave. Well, branching off the axon, there are branches called teledendrites. These three little branches on mine, each one's called a teledendrite. Then branches off the end of an axon, which terminate or end in these synaptic knobs or end bulbs. And so I've got these two over here, and I got my third one, which I've blown up for us to look at. Synaptic knob, synaptic end bulb. An expanded end of the teledendrite, which contains synaptic vesicles. I look on the left, I have synaptic vesicles uh, there containing a neurotransmitter called acetylcholine. And I drew a little, uh, a little structure here, two parts, acetyl and choline. So you know you can tell there are two parts of that molecule. The synaptic knob is located just above the postsynaptic membrane. So there are two membranes. There's the membrane of this synaptic knob on one side of this space and there's a sarcolemma on the other. So the membrane of the uh, synaptic knob the spacing the muscle cell is called the presynaptic membrane. Before the space is called the synaptic cleft. And the postsynaptic membrane is the sarcolemma, the membrane after the cleft. And so finally your next word is right there, synaptic cleft the physical space between the synaptic knob and the postsynaptic membrane. So there's a space, they do not touch. There's a little gel in between the two, so they do not touch each other. Impulses are gonna be transported across this synaptic cleft. You're gonna have an electrical uh, event called an impulse coming down the uh, axon of the teledendrites, which are gonna hit the uh, synaptic knob and depolarize this membrane, which causes a bunch of events inside, which, which involve calcium, to occur that the synaptic vesicles move this presynaptic membrane, fuse and drop or dump acetylcholine into the synaptic cleft. And it's going to try to get across to bind to receptors here in this motor plate that has receptors for acetylcholine. So they're going to try to get across. So you have motor end plate. The area of the postsynaptic membrane which contains receptors that bind with acetylcholine. You see that the receptor sites here are shaped to accept acetylcholine. So the receptor sites are over here on the postsynaptic membrane. The acetylcholine is released by the synaptic vesicles up here in this synaptic knob. 
the they fuse with the presynaptic membrane of that synaptic knob and open up to dump the acetylcholine into the synaptic cleft. And it's going to try to diffuse across that cleft from a greater concentration to lower to bind to these receptor sites to eventually start up another impulse over here. So the impulse is going to be electrical coming down the axon and the teledendrite to the synaptic knob. And it's going to be chemically transported across the cleft to start another electrical event on the postsynaptic membrane. Okay, another impulse. Now that's something that we will uh, talk about, but we're going to talk about it um, in another chapter. The synaptic vesicles contain the neurotransmitter acetylcholine. Well, I've told you that before, and there it is, acetylcholine, ACH. Uh, I got to take that E off. That's a typo, ACH. The acetylcholine changes the sarcolimus membrane permeability uh, and results in an impulse that travels across the sarcolemma and causes the muscle cell to contract. So when the acetylcholine is transported across this cleft, it will start up another impulse on the other side. Now we have some words here before we get to the next slide. And the first one is motor unit. Motor unit. A motor neuron, motor is going to be for going to muscles or glands. Um, so a motor neuron and all the muscle fibers stimulates. I see my motor neuron here stimulates three muscle fibers. It has three teledendrites and each one goes to its own muscle fiber. Fine movements require less muscle fibers to be stimulated per motor unit. So for fine movements where you just need very, very small intricate movements, very few muscle fibers are stimulated and you have very small movements as compared to a gross movement where a motor neuron may stimulate uh, you know, hundreds of, of muscle cells. So that motor is gonna be quite large. And that's be like for gross movements. Walking is not a real fine movement. You know, you contract the leg, you swing it forward, you push it down. Contract the other one, swing forward, push it down. So you don't have real fine movements on that one. but for really fine movements, you're going to stimulate fewer and fewer uh, uh, muscle cells, so your motor unit is going to be pretty small. Your next blank is recruitment. Recruitment, where several motor units are, are used to cause an appropriate movement. Just like you recruit people to help you lift something, your body can recruit more motor units to stimulate more muscle fibers to give you a more forceful contraction. That's how you can reach down to lift something and you see that it's pretty heavy, but you still well, it's heavy, I gotta apply more force, and you call them to affect more motor units that are stimulating more muscle cells, and you lift that object. So you've used that before. Your body uses it all the time, recruitment, just like you would recruit more people to help you push a bus. You can't do it by yourself, so you get more and more people, and the effort becomes greater and greater, and the bus will move. Now, muscle tone, a condition in which motor units of a muscle are always active. This produces a tense, firm muscle as the result of a given number of muscle fibers being contracted at a given time. This is going to be a spontaneous uh, muscle contraction. Now, these are muscle fibers. These aren't entire muscles. So it's the spontaneous uh, impulses are sent down to stimulate a given number of muscle fibers, and it makes your muscles firmer. People that uh, exercise a lot have more firm muscles because their muscle tone is greater. And they have more motor units being stimulated, you know, with few fibers. And it gives them a really firm tone as compared to somebody that doesn't exercise. And when you touch them, they're kind of soft. Their muscles are not firm. So they don't have real good muscle tone. Uh, there's something called muscle spindles. Sensory structures which monitor the tension of a muscle. It's called stretch reflex. Uh, these are in your muscles, and um, if a muscle is stretched, there's, an, there's a reflex that goes off from the stretch receptors by way of a sensory neuron to your spinal cord, where an association neuron transports it across to a motor neuron, which goes out to the muscle fibers in your leg, let's say, and it'll kick your leg forward. So when the doctor gets that little hammer under your kneecap, that's a very, very small stretch that's occurring on the, on the muscles of your upper leg, and it sets off a reflex 
it causes your muscles to contract. Okay, so that's going to be muscle spindles are responsible for that, registering the muscles being stretched. Something else about a muscle contraction and these sarcomeres that are contracting in the muscle, it's an all or none event. A muscle fiber, and you have millions and millions and millions of these, a muscle fiber never partially contracts. The muscle fibers of a motor unit will fully contract or they will not contract at all. So all the, the sarcomeres in a given muscle cell will contract respond, all of them will, and that muscle cell, or none of them do. It's all or none. It's like turning the light on. If the light's on, we'll turn the lights on again. Well, you can't turn them on until they get turned off. So it's an all or none type of an event. Now, we will look at the uh, summary of contraction on another lecture. It's going to be something like explanation of contraction handout. <clears throat> you have a handout in your notes that there's going to be a lecture on that also. <laughs> Muscle twitch. A single rapid contraction or a rapid single, single contraction. So the muscle was stimulated, it contracted, and then it relaxed. So, so the fibers would, would uh, all the sarcomeres would shorten, and then they would lengthen, they would relax. And this, this uh, event that you can record is called a myogram. A graph of a muscle twitch records muscle contraction, uh, force of contraction in relationship to time. The time is across the bottom. The force is, it goes up. That's, session, that's your force. How strong was that contraction? Over what period of time? Now we have some uh, some terms there, and in fact they're over here on the side. Latent period. The latent period is basically the time, uh, the period of time. Well, from the period of time where stimulus is applied until the muscle cell responds. This is going to be uh, stimulus has to go down the axon, teledendrite, synaptic knobs, cross the synaptic cleft, bind to the receptors, and then depolarize the membrane and it starts to contract. So it's that small amount of time, time period from the time the stimulus is applied until the muscle responds. It's usually pretty small. The contraction phase, this is sarcomere shortening. And the relaxation phase is sarcomeres relaxing. So see they have contraction phase and relaxation phase. And they explain it down here a little bit in the definitions or explanations down here. So myograms are a record, a recording of a muscle twitch. Now we have some uh, twitches to look at. Here's our types of myograms. And... Um, First one in your notes is summation or summation of twitches. And you see that here is a twitch here, just a regular old muscle twitch there. That's one. Well, look at your summation. A second stimulus is applied right after the refractory period, which we haven't defined yet, but we will, uh, that's one of the next definitions that we'll get at, to, uh, get at. But you see it's contracted and as it starts to relax, stimulus is hit again. Well, it gives a more forceful contraction. It starts to relax and it's hit again. It'll reach a maximum, but um, this is over a period of time. So you increase the, the time interval between, so it's faster between stimuli. You get wave summation. The second contraction is more powerful than the first, and it'll eventually level off. Now let's, def let's define refractory period. A period of time during which the muscle is responding to the first stimulus. Here it comes up. Here it is it's going up and is contracting up until it begins to relax on the relaxation up until it begins to relax a second stimulus will not have an effect on the muscle fiber so as it's been depolarized and it's con the muscle fibers the sarcomeres are contracting you can't make it contract again it's it's contracting so the stimulus will have no effect on it until it starts to relax and you saw that on a, on a one per second let's say it goes up all the way back down well, this other one may be three per second. So up, it starts to relax, oop, hit again, starts to relax, hit again. So as the, as the uh, refractory period is passed, it can be stimulated again. The free, so I have a refractory period, a time of period during which the second muscle, uh, which the muscle is responding to the first stimulus and is contracting. 
Up until it begins to relax, the second stimulus will not have an effect on the muscle fiber. So your next little uh, comment there is as the frequency of stimulation is increased, as the number of times per second, this is one per second, this is probably like three per second here. Um, as the frequency of stimulation is increased, there's less time for the muscle to relax in a state of incomplete tetanus results. So over here, incomplete tetanus, you see that they've increased it to, you know, probably 10 per second. So it's starting to relax, it's hit again, starting to relax, hit again, starting to relax, hit again. And it has a stair stepping going on here, where it's an increase in the frequency of stimulation until there is no, um, well, there's a partial time of relaxation, but the next one is your complete tetanus. Increase the frequency of stimulation until there is no relaxation period results in complete tetanus. It's just a straight line. As the, abs as the refractory period is reached, right when it starts to turn, where it can be stimulated again, it's stimulated again. So it never can relax. It's, it's contracted, sarcomeres are shortened, and the process can't reverse because it's hit again before it can reverse. And so you get complete tetanus. So you have a muscle twitch. You have a trepi or wave summation. You have a, an increase in wave summation where there's less and less time to, con to relax. And then you have a, a state of total contraction, no relaxation. <clears throat> now, you notice also have trepi, which is basically what this is, the summation here. A stimulation of the muscle fiber just after the relaxation period is ended, which will result in a slightly higher contraction strength. So a summation there also. And we have some terms, uh, isotonic versus isometric. Now, isotonic contractions are when you're lifting something. There's muscle tension with shortening of the muscle. So if you're reaching down to grab a barbell, you grab it, and when you start to contract, you take up the slack, that's tension, and then you lift that barbell with the weights, that's muscle shortening. Those are isotonic contractions, muscle tension with shortening. Isometric, those were something probably in the early 70s or so, or maybe late 60s, it was real big on isometrics. Muscle tension with minimal shortening. This is like standing in a doorway and put your hands on either side of the doorway and trying to push out. You feel the slack being taken up, but then the muscles can't shorten. You have tension. So muscle tension with minimal shortening, trying to walk up to a building and grab the building ledge and try to lift it. You have muscle tension, minimal shortening. You're not going to lift that building. Those are metric. Uh, some more out of your notes, basically. Uh, energy is stored in the muscle as ATP. If you remember that, adenosine triphosphate as well as another high energy compound called CP or creatinine phosphate, C-R-E-A-T-I-N-I-N-E -I -I -E phosphate. Uh, there are about six times as much CP as there is ATP. So you're using both of them. Aerobic respiration is a part of the breakdown of glucose, which results in supplying about 95% of the ATP needed by the resting cell. This production of ATP occurs on the inner membrane folds, the Christi of the mitochondria. So you remember that from general biology, how ATP, the site of ATP synthesis is the mitochondria, is the mitochondrion, and the location is going to be on the Christi. It involves the chemiosmotic apparatus as well as the electron transport chain. Another blank, glycolysis. That was also in general biology. Glycolysis, glyco is sugar, lysis means destruction. The initial breakdown of glucose into pyruvic acid. It's the initial part. Remember, that's gonna be the uh, anaerobic part of cellular respiration. Well, that's what your notes say. This is an anaerobic process which occurs in the cytoplasm of the cell. You have a blank, it's called fatigue, F-A-T-I-G-U-E, a condition of the muscle in which it can no longer contract due to the activity of the muscle, like from exercise, you know, where you just can hardly lift your arms and legs, or depletion of ATP from doing too much, you get real weak. Uh, fall in pH will also cause fatigue. You have to remember, you have to be maintained between 7.35 and 7.45, uh, otherwise you're gonna be in, uh, in stress. 
Now, oxygen debt, the amount of oxygen needed to restore pre, uh, normal pre-exertion conditions, which may have been created due to a period of exercise. That's when you get winded. You can't you're trying to supply more oxygen to your tissues when you're breathing fast and heavy because your body's in oxygen stress, and this is called oxygen deprivation or oxygen debt. Now, I have uh, types of fibers here, fast fibers, slow fibers, and intermediate fibers. Just to uh, read through there, um, you see that fast, it says, produced powerful short-term contractions due to their high ATP consumption. Okay, so those are going to be your fast ones. Slow require three times as much to contract as fast. Small diameter fiber fatigue uh, very slowly due to high, high vascularization with capillaries. Uh, contain myoglobin, a molecule similar to hemoglobin. It's called myoglobin, so it can also carry oxygen. And those intermediate fibers, it says uh, response time is between fast and slow. Contain a little myoglobin, results in a pale muscle color. They're highly vascularized and they resist fatigue. So look over those and get, just kind of get the basic difference between the three types. Um, muscle hypertrophy. Um, can be on the next slide. I just put some in here. Hypertrophy, H-Y-P-E-R-T-R-O-P-H-Y. The muscle fiber increases in size as a result of an increase in diameter. You're not necessarily making more muscle cells uh, when you get large muscle cells, when you exercise a lot, get larger muscles. You're increasing the actin and myosin in the muscle cells themselves. You're increasing the amount of myofibrils inside of each muscle cell. And more myofibrils, more sarcomeres, a more um, a stronger contraction by that sarcomere. So you get a lot more sarcomeres and you have a stronger forceful contraction. So muscle hypertrophying, getting larger muscles, doesn't mean you're adding more cells necessarily, but you're increasing the diameter of the myofibrils uh, in the in the muscle cells, more actin and myosin myofilaments. All right, that's the end of this one. Uh, I'll get on to the explanation of contraction handout in just a minute.